How do you get people excited about a completely new sport in a saturated landscape? We will hear from the Pro League Network founders about how they're trying to do that. Plus, the NBA has not committed to expansion, but the commissioner floated a few cities under consideration. And having a Canadian team in the NHL final is causing a political fight north of the border. It's Tuesday, June 11th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver addressed the possibility of the league expanding at a press conference before the second game of the NBA Finals. In the past, Silver has brushed off expansion talks, saying he's worried about diluting the talent in the league. But now that a media rights deal is getting close, the expansion talk is getting more serious. The commissioner actually went as far as to name three cities as potential locations. Those three are Seattle, which never should have lost the Supersonics, Las Vegas, the site of the in-season tournament final, and Mexico City. There are a number of complications with putting a team in the most populous city in North America, but the opportunity is second to none, and the NBA already has some familiarity with the city because there is a G League team, Capitanes de Ciudad de Mexico, that has played there since the 2021-22 season. Silver was quick to note that there are many other North American cities that could be strong contenders, but it seems that Mexico City has entered the inner circle of potential expansion sites. The Edmonton Oilers' run to the Stanley Cup final has triggered a very strange political fight in Canada. The nation's public broadcasting network, CBC, did not carry the final games of the Western Conference final, which the Oilers prevailed over the Dallas Stars. That caused an uproar among certain conservative politicians who called for defunding the CBC, which is something they were calling for before the Oilers went on their run. Some have gone further to decry the lack of Stanley Cup final games on CBC. The only issue with that complaint is that it isn't true. The games are on CBC. They are also on Sportsnet, which may have led to some confusion here. But Canadian fans are able to watch the games on either network or Sportsnet streaming service. CBC does not own the rights to the games. Rather, it sublicenses them from Rogers, which has them on an 11-year, $3.8 billion deal that runs for two more seasons after this one. If Canadian politicians want the CBC to take full control of the rights after that, Defunding it would be counterproductive. I'm joined now by the founders of the Pro League Network, Mike Salveras and Bill Yucatonis. Welcome, Mike. Welcome, Bill. Hey, Owen. Hey, Owen. How are you? Great to be here. Yeah, great to have you guys on. So the Pro League Network has sports and competitions that are hard or impossible to find anywhere else, including slap fight, paintball, uh, street ball, putt-putt, and card jitsu, which... We probably have to have a little <laughs> explain her about car jitsu. It's basically wrestling in a car is what it looks like to me. Anyways, what what makes a pro league network sport a pro league network sport? Yeah, I think there are a few things. One is I think that um, it's got good integrity, right? So this is a, a sport that has proper rules. It's run well. Um, it's sanctioned appropriately. And there's a real method in the supposed like craziness of, of some of these sports. Um, uh, the second thing is, obviously, it's a sport that looks um, and stands out from the crowd. So it's something where uh, you you would stop, if you would come across it on your social feed, you would stop scrolling and you would look at it um, because it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's unusual, but also it's got that mix of, the way we produce it at least, that mix of, pure raw skill of an athlete and the irreverence of our, of our production. Um, that makes it, that makes it quite interesting. Um, and then the third is, uh, you will probably not be attending it because it was digital first. Um, and in that sense of we, uh, we shoot a lot of our sports, most of them, even from, um, our own studio, or, um, in, uh, we've got a studio in Branson, Missouri and an opening another one early next year. And so we don't focus on live uh, in-person events. We, we produce for a digital for first audience. And what went into that, <clears throat> that decision to, um, yeah, to be digital first instead of you know, more of a spectator sport? Uh, yeah, it was a few things. So if you think about um, the, uh, the trade-offs, if you will, between uh, concession revenue, ticket revenue, and then on one side and then on the other side, you've got uh, the ability to produce content and tailor the content any time of day, day of week, um, and really any frequency. So uh, we can produce content at one o'clock in the afternoon on a Monday, 
because we know that there's an audience there that wants to watch it at home and we don't have to worry about selling tickets to something on one o'clock on Monday when every, everyone's, at, um, you know, everyone's not be able to physically attend a sporting event. Um, mm-hmm. Similar thing for an international audience, right? So if I, if we have to shoot content uh, late into the evening because it hits some international uh, market, we can do that. We have the flexibility to do that. And again, don't have to worry about um, producing it uh, and worry about people showing up to, to watch it and making our, the business case for that dependent on those people turning up. And you mentioned, you know, you've got a certain style of production, certain goals of the production. Um, how are you shaping this content through, yeah, how, how you shoot it, produce it, edit it, all that? You know, we, uh, we were very intentional about both the length of the format of the event, as well as the, you know, the structure and how we go about it. And so, you know, typically what you'll see with any of our events is we'll do, you know, some kind of a pregame show, right? It'll be... Um, could be a betting show show for sports betting. It, it could be something on the athletes itself, but but basically something in a very quick way, in an entertaining way, helps you pick a side, right? Helps you as a fan establish that rooting interest, and then uh, as the event uh, kicks off, um, you know we have lots of in- engagement within um, score bugs, um, stats, overlays, you know things again as a, as a as a fan or somebody that's new to the sport. You can be engaged and that, you know, that watch time is uh, is elongated because we kind of take you along um, through the event. And then, you know, the third part is um, we're also very intentional about our commentating, you know, who we use uh, to commentate, the, the style of that. We infuse a lot of comedy, um, a lot of irreverence without going over the, you know, over the line. And uh, and so that's how we think about that. And even even the the sideline interviews and the athlete storytelling, um, you know, we're very much focused on you know again c- creating that rooting interest and really helping these athletes, um, you know, stand out in in uh, in unique ways. You know, our creative director uh, J T Tilly, who oversees a lot all of our productions, you know, is not some you know thirty year storied sports broadcaster, but a comedy writer. You know, and that's a very mm-hmm. deliberate choice by us because the style of um, style of production that we're producing is uh, appeals to the casual fan and not necessarily the hardcore fan of our sports. I mean, A, because something like the hardcore fan of mini golf is small or the hardcore yeah. fan of kajutsu is, is new, so it's, it's not, not that great, not, not that large. And so we, we really are targeting this casual sports fan who likes to watch something a little bit unusual with some humor to it. Um, and that's a, that's a very deliberate choice from our, our point of view. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what I was gonna, gonna say there was um, it humor. I mean, yeah, irreverence is, is maybe a good word for it. And you can't watch card jitsu and, and feel like you're watching I mean, even something like, you know, UFC or just like any other <clears throat> sport that takes itself very seriously. This is not quite that the the people wrestling in the car are definitely taking it very seriously um but the spectacle itself is a little ridiculous um you know uh mini golf on sort of the opposite end of the temperament spectrum still has that kind of like it's a little bit silly like you know obviously everyone's trying to win but um it, it has it's not you know the pga tour it's um it's something a little bit goofy uh is that um uh, do you, would you say you're doing that because a lot of what you're doing is sort of targeting like the targeting a social media audience who isn't necessarily going to say, oh, we got to tune in to, you know, card it to it too. But, you know, hopefully, obviously, you're, you want to get there. But um, but also you're looking for the the scrolling people who are just like, wait, what is this? Like, yeah, you know, I, it's a little ridiculous. I got to tune yeah, in. For, for sure. But I will say like the the juxtaposition of taking a sport that seems a little bit crazy and kind of serious at times is funny as heck, right? Yeah. Because it's, you know, you look at professional mini golf again, as the example, um, like we've, we've worked with a couple of times with Brian Katrick from PGA tour radio, right. You know, storied uh, broadcaster, you know, masters, et cetera, et cetera, for, for years and years. And, you know, the way that he'll call a, a mini golf event is equally entertaining, entertaining and, and again, also kind of comedic because of the, the, the forum in which he's, he's, he's calling it. But, you know, overall, we look at each sport a little bit different because the fan consumption is a little bit different, right? A combat sports fan 
and why they're a fan, you know, is going to want to see and lean into and be entertained in a different way than maybe somebody on the golf side or, or basketball, you know, being different as well. And so we, we really kind of think about the sport and the fan and the audience. Um, and I think, you know, the mistake would be trying to treat them all the same. Um, there is a rubric, there is a, you know, a, a playbook we have that I think does overhang all of it. But there's also uniqueness to each of the sports that I think as a, as a company and as a team, we do a really good job, um, you know, unpacking that by sport as well. Because it's, you know, again, it's not a one size fits all, uh, but you will see some commonality in the Pro League Network footprint. Um, because, again, we it's to your point about a digital consumption. And, you know, if you're watching a five second clip, you know, we've got to be able to deliver that right away, both uh, audibly, visually and, you know, any of the other graphical static overlays. You guys recently raised two point two million dollars. Uh, what's that money going to go toward? It's going to go through towards uh, scaling our production efforts. Essentially, more content. Um, we have about fourteen. We have fourteen sports in our portfolio. Uh, we may add some at the margins, but really, it's about increasing the the output uh, within each of those brands. For this year, we're really focusing on five to six of these brands that are really starting to resonate with audiences and we want to increase the amount of production that we do uh, with each of those in terms of uh, your relationship to the the athletes involved in all these um how do you find them and can you give me a sense of what they're paid or how they're paid or is there like a sponsorship component or just like yeah what, what's what's in it for them you know into i'll start at the, at the top so in terms of what they're paid our athletes are paid for every event um, and they could win a prize pool as well, um, depending on the sport. Uh, we are sourcing them. I mean, we have uh, calls out for open calls out for athletes and open castings for athletes for all our sports. Uh, some of them are, we have qualifiers, like for example, our World Putting League, where we have qualifiers uh, for, for each of the sports. Some of them have, uh, we know they're, uh, they have a long history in the sport already before we came came to uh, pr to develop the brand, and so we know their reputation. They've won a bunch of tournaments before, and so we choose them like that way. Other way, people will contact us, you know, and uh, you know we've we've been open for calls for athletes on our combat sports. You know, you can go on uh, on our uh, Instagram page, for example, and fill out a, an athlete inquiry form, um, and we sort of go through that um, in it with regularity and and see. Uh, pick which athletes uh, we think might be interesting for them to uh, to come on. The the other thing I'll add too is we spent a lot of time uh, really ingraining ourselves in the community of the sport. Um, you know, figuring out who are not just the athletes but some of the supporting groups. Um, you know, within there, whether it be on the the equipment side, the safety side, the community, you know, kind of social side, and uh, you know, we really kind of look for um, you know. You know any rec any referrals or recommendations of those that you know could fit what we're trying to do, and you know honestly we turn away a lot of athletes, we turn away a lot of sports that we're not interested in because we're very disciplined on you know what's what's the right mix uh, for us. Um, at the end of the day, we want athletes that are compete at the highest level on, on any of these sports. Uh, but but you know to Mike's words earlier, you know they've it's got to be good integrity. Um, you know, they've, they've got to be willing to, uh, you know, really lean into their, their social profile and storytell. And, you know, that's that marriage, that relationship is what's going to help um, everybody grow. But, you know, to your point about compensation, um, you know, t typical structure is they get paid a, a stipend. All the athletes get paid to play. Nobody pays us. Um, and it depends on the sport, you know, what that is. And, and typically each of the sports have um, a, uh, some semblance of a prize pool. Um, depending on the sport, you know, the, the payout structure is, uh, you know, varies. Uh, and then we, uh, you know, we have a, a sales team um, that also works with a lot of brand partners and, you know, starting to build up um, some opportunities there for, for athletes and leagues um, specifically. And a lot of your materials, you know, on your, your website and other places, um, uh, some of the part of the pitch here is that these sports are bettable that you can, you yep. know, put money supposedly on, you know, your favorite card jitsu athlete. Um, how important is sports betting to your model? It's an important part because, uh, you know, we don't, uh, we're not getting ticket revenue or concession revenue to what Mike had said earlier. You know, I think, um, you know, it's not, it, it's important in the sense that, you know, it's exposure, it's monetization. And, you know, our background is, you know, the, the 15, 20 years, each of us 
in sports and gaming. And so we, we very much know the, the regulatory landscape, what it takes to get some of these sports licensed, um, how we, you know, sanction and oversee um, to ensure their sustainability. And so it's, it's, it's part, but honestly, like it's, it, it's a way any sport should look at how they monetize themselves in a more, in a modern age. I mean, you see it with the NFL with, you know, their relationships with books and, and, and uh, data rights and so forth. And this, this honestly is just a way uh, for sports to monetize themselves. Um, and, you know, because we have a network of these sports, it allows us to establish, you know, this kind of rigor at scale, you know, we're not a one-off, um, you know, niche sport operator. I mean, we're, we're, a, we're a made for wagering, made for entertainment network of sports that we feel um, are, would resonate, um, you know, today, whether it's because of the, some of the trends in the market or just sheer white space. And it's that sort of network that allows us to have the conversations with our sports book partners where it might be harder for an individual sport to do that, right? It's, it's worth it while, you know, it's simple. Uh, also, like if you look at the regulatory side, like uh, Bill and I have spent a lot of time speaking with regulators in their offices, explaining our sports to them um, to get them. Each sport has to be uh, allowed for wagering, you know, on a state by state basis. And it was worth the time for Bill and I to invest in, in doing that um, because, of, uh, because of our longstanding relationships and because we have a lot of sports coming through. Whereas if you had a single sport, it's, it's a little bit harder and I can see how you would sort of, uh, not necessarily pay attention to that and, and focus on like selling tickets or other parts of their revenue. If, you know, as, as pro, the pro league network grows and the amounts of, of bets grow, you know, on, on any individual competition, the recipe for, uh, for betting corruption, for someone throwing a match in, you know, whether it's tennis, soccer or whatever is uh, athletes that aren't making a ton of money and a lot of money, on, on the betting side. And so it's easier to hide, you know, you know, someone putting a whole lot of money on, you know, a particular outcome on, on one match. It does seem like you've got that formula here of, you know, probably people aren't going to, you know, be paying all their bills, you know, being a, a paintball athlete or a, you know, a mini golfer, you know, maybe they'll get there. But, um, and so as the betting side grows, are you worried about, you know, catching someone who says, you know, if, if I throw this slap fight match, I get $10,000 or whatever it is. Um, and, and, you know, we, I, I'm just wondering if, um, you know, to what degree you've, you've kind of explored that possibility and, um, and what you're doing to prevent it. We, we, we didn't, we got into the business uh, with the, the safeguards of knowing that could and, and, you know, hopefully never happens, but could happen. Um, and so, you know, we, we don't take that lightly at all. Um, and that's, that's met by several things. One is obviously the rule structure, uh, and the, the sanctioning that we put around these sports, you know, we're, we're very careful about, you know, how, if we have to modify, um, certain events, you know, how we do it in a way that, um, really looks for any potential cheating, like, you know, like things like where golf balls are weighed, as an example, uh, before the the match starts, they're handed certain things. You know, there's there's a bunch of operational stuff I won't bore you with. But then um, separately, we work with US Integrity uh, for third party integrity monitoring. And then thirdly, all of our athletes are registered with ProBet, uh, which is monitored uh, from a wagering perspective at you know at most of the books. Um, and so we put those safeguards in because you know operationally we we do a lot to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, uh, but you know, there's, there's so much, almost so much visibility we have. And so, you know, we're, we were one of the early adopters of ProBet, um, and a big believer of ProBet because of the fact that the athletes and any insiders, whether it be a coach, a trainer, whomever it may be, um, you know, is monitored all, all the way through. And so it's something we watch all the time. It's, uh, you know, listen, there's a lot of risk businesses out there, um, that have different ways that they need to manage their risk. And this is a risk part of our business that, you know, we continue to, uh, you know, to watch and manage. And it's, uh, you know, you know what, no matter what you're doing in, in, uh, in the gaming space, um, everyone is thinking about this. And for us, you know, we, we don't take this lightly. We, we, we built a lot of controls to ensure that this is sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, th I think it's something every league is going to have to monitor, um, you know, like on 
the like the biggest end, like the NBA, NFL, they have to be super tough about this because any hint of a lack of integrity is, you know, a, a huge threat to their business model. On on your end, on the more like Karjitsu end of it, it's more just like, you know, people taking it seriously at all. Like, you know, it's 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 I guess it's the same thing of like, you know, um any blow to your integrity, you know, it only takes one for people to be like, oh yeah, all this stuff's fake anyway, right? You know, even if it's right. like one or two bad actors, it doesn't take a lot for the public to say, you know, this and you know, and also it doesn't take a lot for one athlete to say like I'm not. I'm not going to be a lifelong karjitsu athlete. Like the risk is kind of low. Well, you think that, but I appreciate your point. I mean, you you think that, but there's uh, you know these athletes have a career in doing what they do, right? And maybe they're not doing karjitsu, but they're doing other form of grappling. And you know the sanctioning bodies and the athletic commissions and so forth. You know all that gets reported out, and so it does affect you know their careers in whatever stage they're in. Um, you know, your point take is taken that they're not getting paid, at least today, you know, millions of dollars to compete. Um, and so financially, there might be a, you know, a different, uh, you know, sort of amount, if you will. Uh, but it's all it's all relative. Um, and, you know, the last point I'll say is that, you know, we've been told several times, and I, I certainly don't want to mention any of their leagues, that what we have in, in place is, in some cases, more than what the big four leagues have. Um, as far as policies and procedures and structure and so on. And so, um, you know, everyone just needs to do uh, their job uh, as, you know, league operators to make sure that, uh, you know, as, as, as we all put our sports forward, that, you know, we all follow the same rules and standards, but we can only control what we control. And, and uh, the, you know, the last thing I say, uh, although I just said it was the last thing, is that we don't bring a sport forward for sports betting until we know it's ready. And that's not just integrity of the athletes, but it's it's rules. It's everything, right? We, we want to make sure that it's ready. And uh, when, it, when we think it's ready, we'll, we'll bring it forward. Sounds good. Mike Silveris, Billy Gatonis, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Thank you. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, please tell a friend who you think would too. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.